Okay. Uh, so the Gospels, I'm looking at Mark, uh, Mark 1, and uh, I'm not going to preach a sermon, but I just want to point out something, and then talk in general about the Gospels. So the topic is Jesus and the Gospels. I will try to uh, tuck in a few more little things to add to what our, our uh, good friend has uh, spoken about thus far. <clears throat> if you look at Mark 1... Uh, it says the beginning of, and depending on your translation, it says the beginning of the gospel or the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, as it's written in Isaiah the prophet. Uh, so here you have, uh, this is interesting, some critics uh, have, have a little difficulty here because it starts by quoting Isaiah, but it's not all Isaiah. There's Malachi here as well. It says, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way a voice of one calling in the wilderness, and uh, this, is, <clears throat> this is Isaiah, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. Now, um, or he's, it's, <laughs> I'll tell you where critics go off on this, right? Because it says, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, and then, it, and then it's Malachi. So <laughs> what happened to Isaiah, the rest of it? Uh, generally, uh, you would uh, mention the most notable prophet. You know, in this in this sense, I mean, this is this is. There's nothing wrong with saying this. Um, so we'll come back to this just to just to mention the whole idea of about gospel in a second. <clears throat> but what's interesting about Mark, and he had mentioned it is the shortest, and yet some of the uh, accounts he gives are longer than some of the others. But it has a lot of immediately, immediately, immediately moves it along, moves along that type of characteristic, and yet he begins in his prologue. Prologue here is verses 1 through 8. Uh, the beginning of the gospel, right? The beginning of the gospel, and this is John the Baptist. He puts it squarely on John the Baptist. This is something unique about, uh, unique about Mark. Um, so gospels, we know, four books contained in the New Testament. And if you, if you take the conclusion of Luke's gospel, Luke 24, uh, you could seam it with Acts chapter 1 like this. Uh, both having been written by Luke. So in Luke-Acts, for example, if you take both of those and put it together and just see the relationship in the New Testament canon between gospel as a genre, gospel and, and history, Luke-Acts, um, what do you have in there? One, if you just followed Luke, sort of like a broad brush outline of it, not a complete outline, I thought of a few things here. One, Coming of the Messiah in relation to prophetic fulfillment. That's a big deal with Luke. That's where he's going to start. Uh, he's going to do that with reference to John the Baptist, the birth of John the Baptist, um, things going on with his mother, with his father. In chapters 1 and 2, chapters 3 and 4, you have the empowered ministry of the Messiah. Uh, you have Jesus' baptism, the Spirit anointing him, descending on him as a dove. Then you have him... Uh, in chapter 4, as was just mentioned, his temptation, but, he, but he, he, it basically describes him in 4.1 as being full of the Spirit and then empowered later on, returning under the power of the Spirit. So you see this empowered ministry of the Messiah, the empowered ministry of the 12 and the 70, or the 72, depending on your reading of, of the text, in chapters 9 and 10. Uh, so Luke is, is pretty strong on empowered ministry. He really is. Uh, then, <clears throat> chapter 24, just not, not following all the way through, through the, but just staying thematically, you get to the end, the post-ascension coming of the Holy Spirit. So what happens after Jesus has gone to the cross, um, Jesus has been raised from the dead, um, <clears throat> and now uh, he hasn't ascended yet at the end of, of Luke's Gospel in 24, uh, but if you tie that with uh, his prediction in 24... Uh, you'll be uh, robed with power from on high, the promise of the Father, he, he refers to it. Uh, he tells them to wait in Jerusalem until you've received that. <clears throat> you go to Acts chapter 1, and this, in fact, is what uh, is repeated. And then in Acts 2, this is, this is what, in fact, happens. So <clears throat> there's this sense, then, of empowerment, empowerment, empowerment. Then he predicts this of the 12, which would be the eleven. Um, carrying that over into Acts, empowered ministry, uh, the relation of the Messiah to the ongoing work of his body, too. This is in, in Acts, Acts chapter 1. You see them in the upper room waiting. 
uh, waiting for this promise, Acts chapter 2, the coming of the promise, Acts chapter 3, acting on the coming, basically, chapter 3 on through the end of the church age. There you go. Acts has no formal ending, just continues on. Um, so that's Luke-Acts. Uh, the Gospels, just to add something else here, the Gospels are their own literary genre, and you might not think of it that way, okay? Uh, but we can mention other genres of literature in the New Testament. History, we'd say that's a book of Acts. Epistolary, epistolary stuff. All those letters, whether it be um, James or Peter or Jude or John's epistles or, or Paul's epistles, all of those books, those are epistolary. Those are, those are letters. And then apocalyptic when you come to the book of Revelation. But gospel, gospel is, is, is its own is its own genre. It just reads differently. Um, I'm not saying it's particularly interpreted differently, but it's it's classified differently. So we have those, the Gospels. If you look at Mark, again, Mark chapter 1 and verse 1, he alone refers to what he has written as Gospel. You know, he says the beginning of the Gospel, and then he says about Jesus Christ. Now that um, technically, in, in, to bore you with grammar, but it's either a subjective or an objective genit genitive there, which means it can be um, the good news, which is what euangelion is a Greek word. And so you translate that good news, that's why some translations say the beginning of the good news. Others just stick with the technical rendering of that and say the gospel. Gospel is a technical word, right? If, you, if somebody asks you, what in the world does that mean, gospel? He said, well, it means good news. Hence, you'll find it in the translation, good news. Um, so it's, it's something that is, that is generally heralded or it's something that is spoken. But here it says what? About Jesus Christ, which means it can be the good news that, that um, is about Jesus, his, his life, his death, and those types of things. Or it could be the good news that Jesus himself spoke or delivered, something like that. It's really both and in, in that case. <clears throat> so as such, the relation of Jesus and the Gospels is more than biographical. Uh, so these Gospels, this particular literary genre, you know, where did they come from? What, what were the sources, this, this type of thing? Um, written from, uh, these were written from sources decades later. Uh, I mean, just a few decades later. <clears throat> so the Gospels then, what are their main concerns? Like, why are they written? Uh, it's really a, for a number of reasons, but, uh, and I could mention some of them, but one thing we don't want to forget is for the progeny of those first uh, generation believers, you know? So even, even those are kind of, after a few decades now, by the time these are written, those first generation believers are passing from the scene, which means you really want to set this stuff down. You know, you want to get, you really want to get a, a, a full description of these things for the, pro, I say progeny, you know, but for those generations to come after that. So one, Luke would tell us in Luke 24, 45 and following, uh, with, with Jesus telling them to wait in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high, uh, you would take that and say, well, the Gospels are given for us to embolden us as witnesses. Um, because he would say, you are witnesses of these things. And then in Acts chapter 1, he says, um, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to me. You shall be witnesses to me. Uh, a second thing I would say is to provide a factual foundation for the formation of what could be called or termed the kerygma. Um, that is to say, what, what, were, what was the fundamental message uh, of those early believers? Uh, in Acts chapter, uh, it's just interesting, let me just go here. Uh, Acts, chapter, Acts chapter 2, 42 and following. Uh, this, is, this is after the outpouring of the Spirit at Pentecost and Peter has been preaching and then it just says, Luke, Luke adds in Acts 2.42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, prayer, so on and so on. You see that? So, so you say, well, what was that teaching, right? Because you didn't have the New Testament canon. And so what is it on the day of Pentecost, now just 50 days after uh, Jesus' crucifixion uh, and all those things transpired? So uh, we could speculate as to a number of things that he was teaching, but this is basically... 
setting up this kerygma, you know, and we'll, we'll look at, you know, some of those things in just a second, but, but what is really the substance or the content of the message of that early Christian movement? So here's a factual foundation being given for that. And Luke is going to say this in Luke chapter 1, for example, the opening verses, where he says, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed handed down to us by those who were the first eyewitnesses. And so, so he's talking about sources, extant or existing sources that are out there. And he's saying, listen, eyewitnesses wrote these things down. Uh, he has those available to him, not only as a physician, theologian, but also as a historian, a careful historian. With this in mind, since I myself have, have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, um, so that you may know the certainty of the things uh, that you have been taught. So Christianity, uh, very interesting, you know, uh, not just for uh, its centrality on, on Jesus and the historicity of him, but it is a historic faith. And so it really depends on the fact that Jesus was an actual person who entered into time and space, that those events that are things that he, 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 is, is claimed by Christians who have done that those actually happened, that there was a thing like a crucifixion and a resurrection, that all of these things are historically true. So uh, he was, uh, our, our speaker a moment ago was, was just talking about um, multiple gospels and multiple perspectives and things of, things of that nature. And, you know, uh, critics like the Bart Ehrmans of this world and people like that will fuss about uh, some details and contradictions, uh, even even as he said. So you have three people. So you had two two at the tomb, one at the tomb. How many how many were there? This type of thing, and, you know. So at the end of the day, with all, all these contradictions and uh, all the the nitpicking and fussing about all that stuff, um, you could have a wreck out here on um, whatever North Perry. You could have a wreck out there and have how many people go out and you take their testimony afterwards, and one says, "Well, this happened," another said, "Well, this happened," another said, "Well, this happened." I'll tell you one thing for sure, there was a wreck, right? And so while all these people are fussing and picking apart the New Testament, uh, you know, here's one glaring thing that nobody's been able to disprove is that resurrection, and so that's a, di that's a difficult one. Um, so there are always those types of things when you're dealing with literary uh, documents, when you're dealing with manuscripts, when you're dealing with 400,000 variants among 20,000 some manuscripts, uh, yeah, there's going to be stuff to, to pick at, right? But let's, let's not forget the big, bold, major things that happened in there, uh, and it's hard to get around those. So here, I think, uh, what you have in the Gospels is here's a factual foundation. Um, so this is what we have. I mean, we weren't there. So we rely on this text to give us some deep understanding uh, about uh, what occurred during this time. And I think beyond that, it sort of places us on the ground there. Uh, and I think that's important to know. Outside of just the purely intellectual, factual type of stuff, it gives us a sense of uh, the early Christian movement. It gives us this, the sense of putting us experientially uh, here and I think that's that's a value of having four different gospels. Is it allows us to get these eyewitness accounts? Keep in mind these are these are eyewitness accounts that are that he's he's talking about here, uh, and it's written that way. So three of the gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're referred to collectively as synoptic gospels. Uh, common material implies that, that each are seeing, hence synopsis, are seeing the same events, but from different points of view. They either used each other as sources, uh, they use perhaps uh, sources common to all three, or a combination of the two. And there's tons of, of theories for, for source hypothesis and, and other things, and it can get just so elaborate. But um, I think at the end of the day, there's a, there were sources, and um, they were, under the inspiration of the Spirit, uh, uh, had those sources available to them and their own uh, experience um, as well. Um, each gospel likely written for a different community of faith at a different time and location to bring uh, 
the gospel witness to bear on the needs of that community. The gospel writers selectively edited and arranged the diverse traditions about Jesus that were widespread in the early church. And that, again, is Luke chapter 1, 1, 1 through 3. Luke didn't say, I, I filmed this with a, a video or I, whatever. You know, he says, so I, I, I had these sources and then I was able to compile this. And you, you see that really when you look at the uh, synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you're going to see them ordered and structured certain things in a certain way and to observe that. So they're either following some tradition of certain order and structure. Now, I, I just say this uh, as well, that we have this, this sense of gospel as, let's say, in the, in the Apostle Paul type, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, you know, what is the gospel? Well, there's the gospel, that he died, he was buried, he wrote, you know, like this, right? When, when, when here Paul is just giving the bullet points of, of this whole thing. And in fact, when you look at the literary genre, when you look at the gospels, and you see what's contained in there, for example, and I just... Uh, First, I, I, I had this really nice article, but then I said, forget the article. So I scribbled everything on the front, um, just going through really, really just kind of quickly in my head um, what kinds of things. For example, what, if, if you were telling the gospel story or the gospel to someone, you know, we tend to run right for the cross in there, right? You know, we're just saying, hey, we're all sinners. We all need a Savior. The Savior is Jesus Christ. Put your faith in Him. There you go. When in fact, you know, there is a much... I believe the early church in this kerygma, uh, and, and this is the, the testimony we have from the gospels. Look what's included in there, really. So I'm looking at, you know, first you have this, this, for lack of a better word, the reactivation of the Holy Spirit. We talked about that on Sunday. The, uh, the virgin conception uh, and, and birth and, and all that goes into that, which most people just don't even bother to ar articulate that, right? But, but, if here you are is a, a first century believer and you're trying to justify somehow the Christian faith and the, the uniqueness and the historicity of the Christian faith, you'd have to start with that, right? You wouldn't have to think like, hey, this Jesus of Nazareth uh, character, so where did he come from? What's so special about him? And you start talking about a virgin conception and, and those types of things. And I could spend some time there on that, but I'm just saying that... Um, you know, there's a lot of people today in our society that need to be reintroduced. I mean, most, even in the churches, need to just be reintroduced that this isn't just a story about Jesus and the Gospels, but this is actually part of the foundational teaching of the early church about him. And I think we, we miss that. We tend to just be these reductionists that put it on a pinprick, and here it is. He's just this. He died on a cross. He was buried, there's an empty tomb, he rose again. I mean, that's wonderful and great, but it's the broader context then that gives justification for who he is. Why, why, why sh what, what substantiates his claim to be God in the flesh, as our, as our speaker said, right? Emmanuel, God with us, but what, what substantiates that? How could God be enfleshed how could that even happen? But who talks about this stuff? Who, who talks about things like, like the virgin conception? Uh, and that's interesting. I can tell you, I can go a long time on that one. You know, how in the world does God enter into the human race without sin, without being corrupted if all have sinned? You know, how does that happen? I have an explanation for that. But I'm just saying, these things um, are part of, these are the questions, by the way. Do you imagine the early church marching on triumphant, right? You think they're not asked these questions? Of course they are, right? And you had just plain, ordinary, uneducated people who were steeped in this, and that's represented in the Gospels. It's in here because it's important, and they would have to defend it and did defend it. Um, so anyway, not to, not to park it there, but then you have his baptism, his anointing, right? So here's Jesus of, of Nazareth. When does he become the Messiah? I didn't say when he becomes the Son of God, right? Because he's always the Son of God. But once he become the Messiah, here's this anointing, right? His, his actual, literal anointing with the Spirit. Not somebody putting oil on his head like a, like a king in the, old, in the Old Testament. But here you have his actual anointing. So he's, an, not annoying, anointed. <laughs> so he's, he's Jesus the Messiah. Uh, his temptation. Here's another one, right? His temptation. 
Uh, so what do we even find there? What does that even mean? Can, can God be tempted? Was that a real temptation or all, all these types of things, you know? Now, why are all these important, right? It, but yet we don't find them exactly in this order everywhere, but yet these appear in the gospel. So it, so it was really part of that kerygma, part of the defense, the apologetic, if you, if you would, of the early Christian movement. His public ministry, you see, you see demon expulsion being front and center. What does that mean? Counter kingdom, king and a counter kingdom. His healings, his teaching, his parables, um, his calling of the 12, his empowering of the 12, the Mount of Transfiguration. What does that indicate? Uh, his cleansing of the temple, uh, his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, his arrest, his trial, his crucifixion, his, his entombment. And you see people like Joseph of Arimathea and, and Nicodemus who had come to him by night and there he's present at this thing. What does that even mean? Why is that important? His resurrection appearances, not only his resurrection, but his resurrection appearances, his ascension, and his promised return, right? So listen, there's the whole thing just laid out now, wax eloquent on it, right? Where are you going to get stuck, right? And people start pointing their finger and asking. They deserve answers, right? And this is all justification for why we claim that, that Jesus, our Savior, is, the, is the, the, the Son of God and God God in the flesh and our Redeemer. Okay, so um, I just say that to give you a sense that... Um, now, so, so I'm not misunderstood. So I'm not, misunderstood. Um, I'm not saying that you'd have to swallow all of that somehow and be able to articulate all of that and believe all of that in order to be saved. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying in the broader gospel context, when you think of what is gospel as a, as a genre, what was the kerygma of the early church, what were those early Christians going around talking about? How did they justify their faith? How did they put up a defense? And you see, if, if you could articulate all those points, then you have sort of a seamless garment there. You know, you just have this thing from beginning to end and even beyond the end to return. Um, and the fullness of, of who Jesus is set in the proper context. Um, and I would think that uh, where we mentioned, or Luke had said, of um, the apostles' teaching and those early believers were um, pursuing uh, the apostles' teaching, that much of that, I think as well, was aimed not just at what we find later uh, in the actual Gospels themselves, um, but also uh, justifying their beliefs in Jesus based on the Old Testament passages, right? And so you see a lot of that, especially Matthew, right? You mentioned how Matthew, uh, his big thing is, is uh, fulfillment passages. Uh, Matthew, written for a Jewish audience, uh, as we mentioned, that these Gospels, although different, uh, were aimed at different audiences, different communities, if you, if you will, just in the same way as we have different communities, we have different demographics, different demography, things like that. So Matthew's gospel written for Jewish audience contains links to Old Testament prophecy, fulfillment. This is a big deal with Matthew. He develops his promise, promise fulfillment theme through a series of uh, fulfillment um, formulas. He also has other themes like uh, his separation theme, you know, uh, the wise and foolish virgins, the wheat and the tares, stuff like that. That's also interesting in Matthew. But just to stick with the fulfillment prophecy, Jesus fulfills the Old Testament prophecy. So here's a formula which Matthew uses 10 times where he says, this was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken through the prophet. So 10 times you'll find that in Matthew's gospel. For example, Jesus' birth uh, birth uh, to a virgin fulfills the prophecy in Isaiah 7, 14. You see that in Matthew 1, 20, 22, and 23. Um, his family's escape from Egypt. Out of Egypt, I've called my son. Those, those passages from Hosea 11 and, and others like this. Uh, Gospel of Mark. Uh, Mark's the shortest of the, of the four. Um, Mark tends to write without a lot of exposition. Um, it's thought that, uh, and he, uh, our speaker had said it, it was uh, a Roman audience, but the idea these were Greek-speaking Greek residents of the Roman Empire, or, or any Gentiles for that matter, 
Uh, Mark had a Gentile audience, due, it's thought due to how he explained Jewish traditions. You know, why is he explaining these Jewish, if they were Jews, it's self-evident. But then that's, that's just part of the indi- indication why, why folks think that. Uh, the Gospel of Mark tends to focus most on the adult life of Jesus, mainly on his life and ministry. Mark leaves out several stories that are reiterated uh, throughout Matthew, Luke, and John, such as Sermon on the Mount. Mark doesn't mention Sermon on the Mount. Jesus' birth. Um, there's no genealogy in there. Uh, his appearance after the discovery of the empty tomb. Several of the parables uh, that, that are familiar to us. Mark also focuses on how Jesus kept his identity as Messiah secret. Uh, perhaps Mark's, you know, don't, don't tell anyone. I mean, this is a, a theme in Mark. That Jesus says. So for, for Mark's reason for that may be uh, presenting Jesus as a mysterious figure is so that we don't uh, just see him as a miracle worker, some, some emphasis on, on him personally. Um, now I can ask you the question, who wrote the majority of the New Testament? Um, that's an interesting question. Anybody want to take a shot at that? Who wrote the majority of the New Testament? Mm, including the epistles and everything? Everything. Paul, right? Luke, thank you. Paul. So he wrote, <laughs> he wrote 27% by volume. Listen, 27% of the New Testament, 37,933 words. Paul's second at 23. John is third, 20 like that. You'd never imagine that, would you? But that's just a sheer volume. When you look at Luke and Acts, that's a massive part of the New Testament. So it's typically understood that Luke was a Greek the only Gentile author of a gospel. Each of the gospels features some unique stories, elements, and teachings, but Luke is particularly packed with interesting and distinct parables. Distinct. So you might think, um, wow, these, so these gospels are all kind of the same, or maybe they just see things from different perspectives. Look at Luke. Parable of the two debtors, parable of the friend at midnight, parable of the rich fool, parable of punishment, barren tree, lost coin, shrewd manager, and so on, and we could name these things, other Pharisee and the tax, but all these things, these are unique, these are unique to Luke. Um, now, what about the Gospel of John? And we could say a bunch of other things about these Gospels, but you get a sense that they all make a, a different contribution here. Uh, so, most of the, the synoptics emphasize the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Remember the Sermon on the Mount or where Jesus was saying, the kingdom of heaven is like. John instead emphasizes, this is what's really unique about John and separates, separates him apart uh, and, and his content is unique, is this, this idea of new life found in Jesus. It seems that John is um, interested more in the personal implications of the gospel um, than personal implications than the corporate kind of of implications of it. Um, It's from John that we get uh, Jesus' claim, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father except by me. So the word life, life, appears in John a total of 36 times. It's more than twice as much as it appears in all the other Gospels combined, more than any other book in the New Testament. (laughs) It's rather... That rather significant. Uh, even if you add up all the mentions of life and all the the uh, letters of Paul, Paul only uses the word thirty seven times. Uh, but kingdom, kingdom, on the other hand, only appears five times in the whole book of John, whereas it appears fifty five times in Matthew, twenty times in Mark, forty six. So you get the idea: Matthew, Mark, and Luke, kingdom, 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 and John is rather unique in his content. So there's a whole bunch of things I could, I could tell you about that, but i just finish here. Um, uh, a, a few uh, nuances of, of John. Uh, the content and style of Jesus' teaching in John's gospel is different from the other gospels. Content, uh, instead of talking about the kingdom or the Mosaic law, Jesus talks primarily about himself in John's gospel. Um, instead of using parables and proverbial aphorisms like this in the other Gospels, Jesus delivers long philosophical discourses in John. Matter of fact, just a prologue of John, uh, the first 18 verses, is incredibly deep uh, theologically. So I'll just give you one little piece of depth, okay, just for fun. Uh, uh, and this was mentioned in our, in our video, right? So... Uh, 
Uh, John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then, down to verse 14, and the Word became flesh. So he was talking about the enfleshment or the incarnation of the Word. That's who Jesus is. Uh, but if you just look, this is the sort of philosophical uh, side uh, of John, where he begins with using this, this one Greek verb, which could be translated exist, or in the sense of eternality, eternal existence, the timeless, let's say, say it this way, in the beginning was the word, or timeless, spaceless, uh, uh, immaterial existence. There it is. And so the logos, this word existed this way. Now watch, because you come down to verse 14, he changes it to Ginnah, he changes the verb, and he's, this word, this timeless, spaceless, immaterial word became in time, space, and matter, flesh. Uh, that's part of the philosophical. We don't talk like that. You know, we don't run around talking about it, but that's, that's here. And there's a lot of other just interesting stuff just in the prologue, right? So we would get the sense that um, uh, John's whole presentation of Jesus is um, uh, constructed uh, a little bit differently. So that's, that's interesting. For, another thing, and that was mentioned in the video, is this idea that John uh, depicts Jesus' miracles as signs. So he uses a particular Greek word here, semion. Semion is a single, semia, the plural. Um, yeah. So it's the idea of a, of a sign, and a sign, of course, isn't, isn't the reality, but it points to the reality. And so for John, again, sort of on a philosophical bent, says these things that Jesus did were not ends in and of themselves, just to wow people or to amaze people, uh, but rather they were done as signs to point people, to support their faith, to point them to, to himself in this sense. Um, misunderstanding as well is a, a common motif in John's gospel. And then the idea of symbolism, where Jesus has these, um, where John records Jesus with these seven I am sayings. You know, I am the bread of life. I am the, I am the resurrection and the life. I am, the, I am the, the door of the sheep. I am the good, sh I am the good shepherd. I am the, light of the, I am the light of the world. Um, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So, um, and, and those are really dramatic references, especially when you go to John chapter 8, and he says, before Abraham was, I am. You know, without saying I am anything, but just before, before, wow. Uh, chronologically, that's a trip, right? Because, wow, before Abraham, I am. And all of these strong allusions to Exodus chapter 3 and this uh, basically, again, and this is philosophical, okay? Because uh, the idea of the Lord all caps, L-O-R-D, the Lord God, that's a little bit different, you know, that in the beginning, God, Elohim, you know, in the beginning, but this is what we'd say Yahweh, or, or the old translation, Jehovah. Again, timeless, spaceless, immaterial, self-existent. It would be this maximal being who has maximal power, maximal everything, and all-knowing everything, everything you could possibly pack into the idea of supreme, this is God. And then Jesus is saying, oh yeah, that's me. That's me right there. You know, what's said about, about God, and you can imagine the Jews at this point, you know, they're going to take up stones and stone him because this is in fact what, what he's indicating. That's me. So when Jesus went around saying, I am, I am, I am, um, it had strong, strong references. Uh, last thing, there's, John uses a special vocabulary for salvation. Um, so where in, in the Gospels, it might be like entering into the, into the kingdom. John uses this in, in John chapter 3, remember, with Nicodemus um, entering into the kingdom. But, but more often than not, uh, uh, all the way through John, John's Gospel, it's about having eternal life. You know, who does not have. You remember John 3? That he has, he does not, he does not have this idea. Or, or knowing the truth. Uh, this is a way of characterizing what salvation is. One is in possession of, e of eternal life. One is in possession of, of the truth. 
So anyway, that's just a little uh, stroll through the through the Gospels, and uh, we hope uh, then that's beneficial. So there'll be a second, I think a second part to next next time will be a little bit more on Jesus and the Gospels. So um, we'll pick it up there.